uh, thank you to CK for, for this uh, wonderful platform. Uh, I think just, I, I was just thinking in my mind, this is basically like a conference that we, we used to attend all the time, uh, except that now it's, uh, of course, virtual in the comfort of your own home. And uh, important thing, there's no food provided, but I think CK will find out a solution for that uh, eventually. All right. So with Alibaba Cloud, uh, I'm with Alibaba Cloud. I'm a solutions architect there. And today we're talking more about the logistics uh, solutions. And I, within the next couple of slides, I try to frame uh, why Alibaba has an interest in this uh, logistics space. Yeah. So this agenda for today, we talk about the, the space itself, uh, supply chain logistics, very large space covering so many different things, I think. But uh, I, I hope that after this session, you have a bit more uh, appreciation of what we are doing in each of these different domains within this very large space. Right? And then we'll talk about a few solutions that we have uh, recently launched, the Digital Supply Chain Center, uh, a bit of a mouthful, we'll just call it the DSCC, and a vehicle route planning solution that's more relevant for uh, the current landscape where we are trying to uh, perhaps move to a more delivery focused type of uh, economy, right? So this is uh, for folks who are not familiar with Alibaba as a group, right? We are, we are pretty uh, entrenched in the uh, retail and wholesale space. I think this is where most folks will get to know us. Uh, Taobao, AliExpress, Alibaba.com, you know, if you buy stuff and you do some shopping, you would love uh, our products there. Uh, we also have under our our wing, uh, Lazada, which is a fully owned subsidiary by now. Uh, if you go to the uh, EXA tower near downtown, actually there's the Lazada logo right beside the uh, AXA logo right now. Right. So, but in China, this is we are actually operating as a pretty uh, multi-faceted type of a company. So you see, just to give a few examples, we have this Fresh Hippo. Fresh Hippo is our concept of a supermarket. Uh, you know, a, we try to ensure that the uh, food items and products are trackable, traceable, and all that stuff in terms of sources. We also have this, uh, I guess, I should, like, there's no choice I to pronounce it in Chinese. Elema is called uh, E-L-E-M-E, -E, right? So it's basically Deliveroo uh, Food Panda in China. We have Fliggy. Fliggy is a uh, travel website that we can uh, book travels from. And uh, we also have quite a bit of uh, interest in uh, the sort of Yoku, basically is a YouTube of uh, China, right? So we also have Alibaba pictures. We have a couple of pretty cool films that we have, we have launched. So out of all this, right, all our businesses are actually supported by a few core business units. So of course, Alibaba Cloud being the, the most uh, important in terms of the IT, uh, perspective. We provide the, the infrastructure for all the technology solutions to be deployed in. Uh, we also have AMAPs, which is more like a Google Maps, and financial, providing financial and payment services. Uh, and very importantly for today's session, Cainiao basically is our logistics platform. So what we do is this handles all the logistics related requests that we, we need throughout our ecosystem. So today's uh, solutions actually are born out of China, but because Alibaba Cloud is the technology infrastructure provider, we also are the technology exporter for the entire group, right? So we are one of the largest food and beverage group companies, I guess uh, these are our different channel companies. Uh, that's why in a way we do understand what are the major pain points in the supply chain uh, ecosystem. I think the very, most important one, which is something that everybody will have is, where's my stuff? Where are we at this point in time? The whole visibility of uh, the entire supply chain, I think that is something that is still, uh, as of now, I think there are a few point solutions here and there that allows you to trace and track certain stuff, but there's no uh, high level overarching view over where everything is or what, what state is my warehouse in, you know, wh where am I? Uh, what problems should I be looking at right now? So I think that part is very important for us. And then for, from our perspective, once we have tackled the visibility problem, then we can go into the data, what we call data-driven decision-making, right? So where you can then say, all the information I have, 
how do I then leverage on all that, not just for monitoring, but also on making decisions for the future. You know, what, how should we size warehouses? Which routes are more busy and should we have more trucks servicing those roads? So those are the decisions that have to come in after we gather all the relevant data. So the first step towards that, right, is a transformation to this, uh, what we call the Digital Supply Chain Center, which we'll talk about more later. So this starts with being visible, then more insights, and then you can go smart. So key benefits, I will just briefly run through that. I think some parts are quite quite obvious to most folks, uh, but certain things like consumer, uh, I think this part actually as logistics or supply chain folks, uh, depending on where you stand within the, 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 the whole chain, right? You may not be too, uh, I mean, having too much of a concept of the consumer. So I think, but that's the, the part that actually drives most of the, rest of the chain, right? So if there's a sudden pickup and demand for face masks, for, for example, what we are facing right now, uh, how then do we trigger workflows down the entire uh, supply chain to ensure that we can meet those demands? So those things are actually what drives everything else. So it's not the regular warehousing. Uh, I mean, th those stuff are important, but we do all this because we have consumers who, are, who have demand for products. So that's basically the main part. So for us, I think also another part is a quick problem detection. So this one, I think we'll quickly, we'll slowly cover throughout the rest of the uh, the presentation, and also uh, collaboration. You know, there's a means of uh, sending messages or tracking uh, incidents across. Uh, when when we have incidents, we must be able to track them. Yeah. So this is the digital supply chain center part, the DSCC introduction. Uh, don't get, don't, don't be too worried about this uh, solution architecture. We'll briefly talk about each of the important squares. So we'll try to cover most of these squares. I think what we're trying to say here is that this solution, we're not here to sell you the solution, but I think in terms of each of these boxes could be parts of technologies that you may be looking at. Right, so as a collective uh, mindset, you may be in different phases of your of your digital transformation. So you may be looking at different parts. So we are trying to motivate uh, what could be in these boxes, and then I mean, if you feel free to uh, further the discussion with with myself and our team or uh, uh, later. Right. So the control tower, basically, in our concept, we we are actually quite big on this. We actually have op centers and all these uh, dashboards for almost everything, right? So th this is actually a way for us to be able to monitor what's happening on the ground. So of course, this abstracts out the, the major challenge, which is how do we even get the data from that side? So this one, I'll, I'll just throw the ball over to Arno. So Arno will settle that later. I think he's talking more about the IoT and the blockchain stuff. So from the customer demand analysis part, this is where things get interesting, which remember what I was talking about uh, previously, is where are we able to, from this demand of uh, even across different regions, different seasons, or you see sudden spikes in demand, how can we use that information and we flow down, down the entire chain, and then we can be, be able to spin things up faster, we can preempt uh, certain demands coming in. So this is, I think most people, this is quite challenging if let's say you, most logistics, for example, if you're into logistics, you're probably in the middle portion, right? So you you, you will tell me, hey, how am I able to for, forecast or foresee consumer demand when I'm not even operating the merchant platform? So that's where we, we need to be looking at things from a different perspective. Like if we are not able to forecast consumer demands uh, specifically, perhaps we can have a you know, high level view of, you know, based on different addresses, uh, these folks buy different volumes of items. We don't need to know what's inside those items, but that could also help in our planning of uh, how, how many delivery men do we need, how many uh, trucks do we need and things like that. So, I mean, different perspectives for different uh, stages of the supply chain. So from inventory analysis part, I think there's another, oh yeah, cool. 
So looking, this is more from the warehousing perspective already. So when we look at the warehouse, uh, how can we then try to reduce our warehouse costs by, you know, purging inventory, right? So when we say unhealthy inventory, it could be inventory that's been there for, you know, sitting there, nobody buys it. You know that, you know, it's an old, perhaps it's an old iPad model. Uh, nobody's going to buy it, you know, they're just sitting there raising space. So can are we able to identify these inventory and then try to clear them out uh, using other methods like perhaps fire sales and stuff like that, or uh, other means uh, transferring them to warehouses that are lower cost, things like that. So this is more towards the warehousing side. Fulfillment also towards the warehousing side, inbound, outbound. Uh, are we healthy when it comes to, you know, uh, are we overcrowding our warehouse or is our warehouse underutilized? So there's a sweet spot that we, we want to be in. So this uh, provides us with a bit of uh, monitoring. So this is based on all the data that we can collect from your inbound outbound orders, right? So at the computer level, right, as long as we have all the data in, in place, this is actually pretty straightforward to handle. But but currently the problem is uh, even in, in China, even in a lot of our partner uh, um, sort of ecosystem, um, most of the folks are still doing things manually. So it, it becomes that we are tracking, we are like, hey, what's, what's going on here? You know, so there's there's a lot of uh, uh, steps that need to be taken before we can get to this point where we can get all the data in, and then these are the this the stuff that I'm talking about today, right? Are uh, the easy stuff. The hard part is getting the data on online. It's more towards the the customer side. Are the customers happy with the delivery times? Uh, what are the complaints that they have? So this can actually help with your your eventual, you know deciding um, could be also SLAs that you, you have with your with your suppliers or your customers, uh, basically the folks that and, and trust you to deliver their goods. So this can actually help to justify to them that, hey, you know, the folks are here on time and all that stuff. Yeah. And I think towards the end, right, what we are looking at is actually how do we then integrate all these different channels into our supply chain ecosystem, right? You see, everybody comes in with their own systems, with their own uh, requirements. How then as a, you know, you're you are managing a, a supply chain, even let's say for a product, right? So you have all these raw materials coming in from different places even, right? How, how then are we able to have a high level view or even at a lower level view if you want, of what's going on within that, that supply chain. If this, this vendor suddenly disappears, uh, can we then find another person to, to handle that, right? So, and does that disrupt, does that mean we have to spin up a whole new system, whole new applications for my entire workflow, right? So I think the next slide will be more towards of, I think what we want to do from the data perspective, right? So I think we are jumping around a bit, but hang in with there. Uh, hang in there with me. So this this is, I think, I feel personally one of the more important parts uh, of all kinds of systems. Basically, you are talking about data coming in from manufacturing. For example, look at the bottom: manufacturing, procurement, orders, all kinds of things. Right? You have also external data. How can we, you know, harmonize and standardize that data that we can? build applications that are not just, you know, this application is just for this company. This application is for that company. And we have one demand forecasting for my entire company. And then we can basically ingest data. We can make use of data from all the different sources, right? So this is the part where, where it's, it's a bit more important. So this concept is what we call the data mid end, not just applied to the supply chain uh, ecosystem, we, we have used this to great success across our group uh, where we have definitions, for example, for something as simple as a product, right? If you go to product, for example, so we can have different definitions for, for the same thing. Let's say products in, in, in your one of your business units, you call it, uh, you identify them by SKUs. Uh, the other business unit calls them item numbers. The other calls them product numbers. So then from the data perspective, right, you have to have a customized 
code basically to address each of these products and then you know make use of them when it comes to the application side so for us what we are trying to do is standardize things same definition for for customers products everything else you don't have to touch your crm systems you don't have to touch your accounting systems we ingest the data in and then we do that one time conversion one time standardization and once you have your common data pool here everything else becomes easy right you can build everything that i talk about just now straightforward right your bi to reporting everything is very straightforward apps can be built on top of it uh biggest problem with big data everybody's talking about big data it's not the big data models it's not the training and everything there's everything's out there it's just the availability of data and how uh, the quality of the data that you that you bring in so this this data mid and uh, segment right this is this component is quite important to ensure the data availability and the data quality yeah. all right so after all of that okay so everybody's most most favorite stuff is kpis so with that actually th this is the part within our dashboard our system that allows you to define matrix so because you have everything all set up right then can we have new matrix for example uh how late how length of time that uh, each package is delivered for example uh so that can be a kpi that we can track so with with this data with the visibility of what's happening in your ecosystem then you're able to set matrix that say hey we, we want to track how many packages are late how many packages are you know have been in the warehouse for too long and all that stuff so you could set this matrix and then you can you don't have to look into the all the nitty-gritty stuff you can just look at the matrix level are we healthy or are we not healthy right so i mean different folks different uh folks will look into different uh di different different granularities of the data yeah. right reporting goes along with the kpi stuff right? if things are not going well then you you have a portal you have a app it's quite straightforward for most folks yeah. all right so that that basically it for the dscc part uh right now i only have a couple more slides left so i'll be pretty quick so this vehicle route planning is also part of the time mail system uh so what we have here is uh think about it because we are looking at um smes you know local companies that are moving into this whole delivery concept right you know i i envision at least for the next six months i don't think we are we're going to be able to be shopping on mass in you know at vivo city or whatever right so delivery is definitely important so what happens now is if let's say you are a small business owner you sell stuff right and then right now every day you're getting like five to ten orders okay fine i can dispatch those orders very easily i can say hey uh this person will deliver orders abc the other one will, will deliver bf right so you, you can dispatch it yourself manually fine but once we get the order numbers up to let's say you have 50 orders a day 100 orders a day we're not even talking about thousands uh 50 so who delivers what to where right so that becomes a major uh pain pain point for for the business owners so what we have with this vehicle route planning solution is basically this you give me a list of your orders addresses and some constraints it could be the size of the product it could be the size of your vehicle it could be the working hours of your delivery man right so you give me those constraints and the information and i i already have the model i crunch them i tell you hey this delivery guy in this vehicle will deliver these orders right straightforward stuff so this is a api that's uh, basically readily available for for use right now so this actually is born out of our smart dispatching because we have a food panda equivalent uh previously it was quite intense they, they have a 29 minute uh guarantee for delivery and if it doesn't deliver by 29 minutes actually the the whole meal is free so yeah we lost a lot of money from there but also we we saved uh we learned quite a lot from this whole experience where you know uh how can we challenge ourselves to deliver things fast I think that that's the important part and this is a bit more of a segue if you are more a b2b or enterprise type of a uh, you're looking at more into the container optimization i think th this is not just from china actually most of the solutions i i talk about 
we are not the only ones providing us. So this is this session is more of a, how do we reject our mind frame into thinking about technologies when it comes to logistics? All right, so back again, uh, thanks CK and IOTSG for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, about some of our projects that uh, we are doing at CITA on the supply chain. And I would like as well to, to thank the Singapore Counter Society, Sachin, Phoebe, because they were absolutely great uh, and leading really uh, knowledge in Singapore on the IoT chapters. Uh, before, quick word about myself. So my name is Arnaud Broly, I'm French, seven years working in, uh, in Singapore. And I'm leading some digital solutions uh, within CITA. And I will tell you in, in a second who is CITA, because you might not be aware about our company. Uh, but to conclude on my side, so I have a background in uh, telco, retail, supply chain, and uh, more recently at CITA in the uh, air transport industry. My goal, my job here, is to bring innovation uh, into markets. So playing with technology, playing with startup, labs, but from that, uh, creating solutions to fix business issues uh, in the market and to solve real business problems. So moving on, uh, CITA, so with CITA, even if you might not know us, but uh, if you one day in your life, uh, you took a plane, you certainly use some of our service. So we are a technology provider and uh, we are here for around 70 years. And what uh, makes us a bit special is that we are 100% uh, owned by the air transport community. So our shareholders are airline with the Council of Airline, Airport, Grand Handlers. And uh, yes, we are serving our air transport community um, needs of uh, innovation and technology and solutions. Uh, and just few numbers, so we were pretty global. So we are present in 200 countries and territories, uh, locally, physically present at more than 1,000 of airports. And we have uh, around 3,000 of customers who are, as I said, community of transport, the airline, the airport, and the government uh, were working with us. So today, so I will talk about supply chain uh, in the air transport, and I have just a few data to, to start with. You might be aware about that, but in the old, the, the different mode of transport, so roughly, um, the air transport, the aviation sector, is uh, very, very, very small uh, in terms of volume. It represents just 1% of the global traffic but the value is very high. So those 1% of volume represent 35% of the value of the good uh, traded globally uh, worldwide. Whereas the other mode of transport, uh, the Maritimes, is a bit the other way around, huge volume, 70%, and for around 43% of the value. And the other, the ground, so the terrestrial areas, the trucks, the rail, uh, respectively, uh, 18 and 9% of the volume. So today, I will uh, specifically and only talk about the, the air transport uh, industry. But the last slide to give you um, a bit of flavor about what air cargo is. So you might remember this series, a wonderful series. So you have some Netflix addict potentially connected. And uh, Jack Bauer spent a, he did a lot of things in 24 hours. So this was the goal of the series. So stronger than Jack Bauer, better than Jack Bauer, what happened during 24 hours in the air cargo? So we're not go through all of those numbers, but it's huge. So in 24 hours, I would say in a normal situation, of course, with COVID uh, today, uh, as you could imagine, the uh, situation is, we are seriously impacted. But I would say on a, on a normal stat that we had a few years ago, so in 24 hours, you have 100,000 of planes taking off. 657 million of package, which was roughly a $17.8 billion transferred. We have the 900 million of letters sent in 24 hours, and around 1.1 million of smart smartphone sheets all over the world. So very busy industry, and um, and of course, this industry, and unfortunately, is as well facing some uh, serious challenge. Because the air cargo industry, um, it's an industry which hasn't moved much uh, over the past uh, 40 years. So in a, in a business relationship between the main stakeholders, who are usually the shipper, the guys who want to send something to somewhere, the forwarders are managing the logistics, uh, the ground handlers around, the airline transporting the goods, uh, the customs, which we are facing at the origin and destinations uh, with regulatory, regulatory um, uh, uh, I would say processes, and the consigning with receiving the, the goods. The big problem that this air cargo industry is facing is mostly the lack of visibility. So the shipper always wondering, oh, where is my shipment? Is that okay? Why is there some delay? 
uh, the airlines are looking for the container as well. Uh, everybody uh, screaming about, oh, but what about the document? Because without the document, no shipment uh, can move anywhere. Um, this is an industry where, which is highly fragmented with a lot of actors, many custodians. So in the simple transfer from airport A to airport B, you can have up to 12 actors in the middle and some of them using a different communication standards, uh, which mean different silo, which cause a lot of problems. And even the handling um, is not easy. Um, we have around per year, around 30% of the container in uh, aviation. Uh, which are damaged or lost every year, which is uh, quite significant. And last but not least, and I don't want to, to paint the situation with black, but yes, this is an industry uh, which is significantly using paper uh, operations. And despite IATA, the International uh, uh, Air Transport Associations, uh, who have some very strong initiative in digitizing uh, key um, transport documents as the airway bills, still there is a lot of uh, uh, manual entry uh, paper um, and paper in use. Just to conclude on the, um, on to, to illustrate with a simple drawing about how fragmented is the air cargo. So you might see in your screen, transporting from the shipper to the consignee. So you have the freight flow, so the physical good in blue, going from your warehouse to your airport, loading in the belly of the aircraft, second airport, and then truck to the, to the to destinations. It looks easy, but the data flow is crazy. So we have around 22 documents sent around uh, 41 times, which is very complex. And one of the reasons for the IT people connected is that the way the industry, the stakeholders in Kawa are communicating is mostly uh, using some uh, uh, messages protocol, which came from the ITs. So we have a, a cascade of messages, which uh, include a lot of data discontinuity. Uh, it creates a partial network visibility among the stakeholders and consequently um, a long reconciliation uh, to process the transaction. So this is an issue. And somehow, what, what the voice of the industry, what the goal and what the dream that uh, in air transport the players are really looking at is a system is a tool, is something which can really bring a, a digital consensus of the record among themselves. So what, what, what we mean by digital uh, consensus, so it's a kind of digital agreement among the traditional trading partners to valid or invalid uh, an event. Oh, uh, where is my, uh, my shipment? It is there, is it left Changi? Yes, no, it arrived in Paris, whatever. So the current state of the asset, which is traded, and a better way to collaborate, to transact, to exchange, in order to, miti to mitigate disruptions. And through that, of course, uh, reaching an end-to-end -end process visibility, automating as much as possible the process, getting alert, getting a better SLA uh, uh, visibility, and enhance the overall processes. So that's pretty much um, what really the industry is looking at. So what CITA uh, and our partner, what are we doing in this, in this picture? So we are a technology company, technology provider, as I said, and when we are looking about um, the issue the air cargo is facing, say, oh, hold on, we have a toolbox. And we have a toolbox, we have a lot of IT uh, interesting uh, solutions which may be, and which may apply, which may solve those kind of problems. And we think that technology always is an enabler need to serve a business purpose. And it's not a technology against another. So we are not saying, oh, mobile is better than IoT, better than blockchain, better than AI. And, aligning all the buzzword uh, of the world, but we do think and um, that the combination, the convergence of uh, those technologies could make sense and would solve uh, this uh, air cargo supply chain issue. So what if in um, the supply chain, we'll have a world where data and new data would be captured by IoT. So IoT is booming with billions of sensors in any industry uh, becoming uh, more and more the, the norms and the benefits what we believe in air cargo is that those sensors can bring some data which are totally unknown today or not captured by any IT systems. So that could be a source to bring some visibility when we are blind before. The second technology in our toolbox, uh, which we think makes sense, is a blockchain. I will not detail what is blockchain, but blockchain has some attributes, uh, which we believe is a way to aggregate uh, some multiple data flow messages, IoT, mobile, whatever, where the data come from, and to orchestrate the process, the different event flow, and managing the, the distribution of the data in a secure way among the, um, the different stakeholders. 
And here we are talking about enterprise blockchain, basically, no coins, uh, no crypto uh, at stake here. And last but not least, AI, so artificial intelligence, which will be especially useful um, by bringing the ability to recognize some meaningful patterns that we would have from these tons of data, uh, from systems, from IoT, and whatever the source is. And the goal being be to, to enhance decision-making process or to support a decision-making process. So we are looking at this toolbox and say, okay, but what we can do with that? So we are scratching our head, thinking about some stories, and we say, but what if uh, we can really make it real? So what if we can really combine those technology and uh, in a thread line to really monitor shipment and containers from uh, an airport A to an airport B? So we were maturing these ideas with my colleague, uh, Aurore, Luca, who are listening to us, I guess, today. Uh, and after fine-tuning this story, we tried to onboard some partners. And that's the first time in uh, air transport that we managed to bring on the table one shipper, one airline, one friend forwarders, the two uh, ground handlers, uh, in order to monitor uh, from Singapore uh, to Paris the different events which would occur uh, during transportation and to log that onto the blockchain, bringing the IoT to get those data which are unknown for the moment, uh, bringing the location and the condition of the shipments, uh, monitoring the chain of custody, who is in charge and when, at which moment, uh, bringing alerting to all the community uh, to better manage the disruption in case, and digitizing uh, some key documents, mostly airway bill for, for those who are familiar with that. So, so we are quite happy to, to do so and to give you some of the description and learning about this use case, First thing is, yes, the complexity is to bring those guys together on the table. And it's perhaps the biggest challenge that we are facing beside the technology is to bring those stakeholders together, uh, let them to buy the story. But through a process, business process analysis, trying to understand really how things work, because we have the theory and the reality. And of course, it's totally different. And so it's very interesting to see people even talking together and discovering how their partner, customer are working as well. But the key thing is that what's in it for me? So the first question, and you can go nowhere, if we cannot identify the benefit for each and individual stakeholders, airline, forwarders, and so on, but as well the collective benefit. And that was a really uh, interesting uh, exercise. And after doing all of that, it's about data sharing. And sharing is not really something that uh, I would say is really natural uh, in our ecosystem. So agreeing what kind of data, what kind of events, uh, each party are interested to collect, to bring, to give. So it's a give and take exercise. So after doing that, so that's where the IT uh, start to, to come into the picture. Um, when we talk about bringing sensor to capture data, uh, we are in a in highly regulated world where security and safety is the utmost priority for passenger and cargo. So we need to have some uh, sensors, but aero compliant sensors and which is a total different story. We have a million of norms from civil aviation, so IATA, European Space Agency, but battery, electromagnetic emission, and so on. So we are really lucky, and we are working uh, with a company, a startup called B1, based in France, represented by Pierre Gentinet, which may uh, listen to us today. And those guys um, are really an amazing technology, uh, sensors, which fit, which tick all of those boxes, and which allow uh, indoor and outdoor geolocalization of the containers through different technology, GPS or Bluetooth low energy for, for the purists, uh, providing alerting of temperature, if you have a certain threshold, humidity, shock, vibration, and so on, to really control what's happening in, during transportation of your shipments. And the battery life is uh, quite exceptional because those sensors are not powered by any uh, energy source, totally standalone, uh, and they reach uh, three years plus uh, battery life. And very important as well to, to minimize the service of uh, and the battery change uh, for such sensors. So one of the secret sources, by the way, is that um, they are using um, a very new and innovative, uh, I would say, a transmission uh, channel. And uh, for those who are familiar in the IoT world, uh, leveraging what we call uh, an IoT network, a communication network called uh, LP1, so Low Power Wide Area Network. So long story short, it enabled very low level of data, a ping from a sensor, to be transported in a very long distance and consuming very, very low energy of your sensors. 
so the three-year battery life without any power source. And you have two main players uh, in this area, so Sigfox and Laura, who are really doing a great job. Uh, for us, it's very interesting. Uh, why? Because they are the one to build up the network. And right now, LP1 technology for uh, aviation players uh, are today uh, available in more than 65 countries, uh, present at 200 airports, uh, without any infrastructure to be built uh, for us as a customer, as a user of this uh, transmission. And uh, so, yeah, and the second part, so we talked about the IoT and the data capture, is that now, what do we do about the blockchain play? So the blockchain, as I said, was really the aggregation platform. So from different sources, talk about the IoT for uh, geolocation, monitoring temperatures, but as well, all the stakeholders are using the existing uh, way of working, the EDI, the message, the current protocol of communication that we integrate into the blockchain. And um, but what we've done here is the deployment of the blockchain to the different members, having a node and configuring uh, the use case. So the use case, as I said, being a logging, uh, timestamping of the event and sharing uh, with everyone, uh, having the different data about the sensors, the alertings, and making sure that everyone would know what's happening into the process compared to a peer-to-peer -peer or sequential uh, data sharing that we have currently. So last, um, what we are exploring right now uh, with a very innovative startup uh, called uh, Podcast, uh, it's an AI-driven optimization because a lot of those data uh, can be aggregated onto the blockchain. And by the way, I should mention that we're working with another startup called Sky Republic for the blockchain, um, is that all of those data are great, but we need to do more, how, how we can use them in, in a smart way. So by leveraging those historical data, feeding them with some updated data, economical data, we aim at, at creating some patterns which would help to predict uh, if there is some uh, flight delay, to predict this flight delay, to anticipate disruption due to flight delay, and in supply chain is, is critical, and even more in maritime, by the way. Uh, the container location optimization. So if tomorrow morning you have to ship for uh, three, five uh, containers and you have nothing, nothing available, what would be the best route to bring back your container to not lose uh, one day of, um, of transportation? and the demand prediction, how to optimize your capacity planning uh, through the pattern that the AI uh, could help you to better uh, accurate your forecast. So to conclude, so this is a use case uh, that we are working here in Singapore, again, for this trade line between Singapore and France. Uh, but what next? So um, we believe that the story uh, will not stop right now. So there is three main areas that we are looking at. Uh, first, in financial, so one of the steps would be to look at the trade finance and how we could automate um, some of the financial impact on the supply chain, the settlement, invoicing, payment, or penalties uh, through some smart contracts, uh, mostly from the blockchain. Another thing we're looking at is to, to implement uh, what we call KYC, know your customers, uh, just to make sure that in the supply chain, if you are dealing with some companies, you can make sure that they have some verifiable credentials that are not, uh, I would say, uh, suspicious that you don't want to do business with, to make uh, things simple, so that's the right certifications in an indisputable way. For transportation, we, we already anticipate and working with a, a company called ULD Care for uh, interlining, so interlining about containers, so keep tracking about the, those containers either when they move from one airline uh, to another airline, and looking at multimodal, because as we saw earlier, air transport, uh, is really 1% of the volume. So what if you could build some bridge between the maritime industry, uh, the rail, the, the, tr the terrestrial transportation, uh, in order to, to keep this vision, to keep this tracking monitoring across the board. And on the regulatory, we as well look at the custom, uh, digitization of custom, enhancing the custom process, maybe possibly uh, manage some preclearance uh, in order to fasten the, the supply chain in, uh, in air transport. So to, to conclude on my last slide, I just would like to say that, um, especially in this time of trouble that we're facing in supply chain, uh, that is a time to leverage uh, innovations, new tech, startups, uh, to optimize and to, to take the best of those technologies to make the, to make the difference. Uh, it's always a multi-collaboration approach. We don't believe that uh, we can, of course, improve as much as we could alone, but now the um, efficiency gain should be really um, seek through a collaboration, through alliance, through consortium, in order to share 
and to collectively make things, uh, this whole process better. And to not forget the industry standards, especially for adoption of those new technology, uh, because we need to, to build up on what has been uh, created. And the industry, and especially in, uh, in aviation, when it's an highly uh, regulated uh, environment, building up, upgrade the industry standard, making them evolve will be as well a, a, key, to, a key to success. We see many infrastructure as service companies, as companies moving forward to offering platform as a service, the PaaS. Uh, how do you see this shift helping the supply chain community at large innovate and build new solutions like AML, AIML? I don't know what which example I should take, but uh, what is your view? Maybe I think it's may relevant for you, Junior. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think generally what we are looking at here is uh, pass and all these A pass and all, uh, SaaS kind of stuff, right? So what what they are here to do is to abstract away stuff that would that you either don't want to do or you don't want to uh you know again hire a whole bunch of folks to help you build a data center when you you're not even sure if you're going to get to that volume of data for example right so that that's actually here as a good stepping stone uh, again back to the same so you can focus on what you're good at doing because i think as much as we all want to be perfect at everything right so sometimes you have to admit that like for our case we we are, we are like myself, we do a lot of ML, uh, data science type of projects. We're we good at that, right? But when it comes to all the IT, you know, database systems and stuff like we may not, I, I may not be the best to the person, but I could just use whatever is available, right? And then I deploy my solution on top of what is available and what is guaranteed to work basically, right? So I could be more focused when it comes to deploying the solution. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think uh, I echo your, your message as well. Uh, in terms of like I mentioned this morning, I was uh, having a call with the potential project where you have to deal with maybe the data from the micro grids with the asset management systems and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So when we are evaluating this six, seven layers of technologies and within the platform layer, as we know, there are multiple platforms. One mm -hmm. is just a, a, a event broker platform could be, one could be a AIML platform, one could be just an ingestion platform. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, as you said, rightly that if a company try to do everything, they're not going to go anywhere, basically, right? Mm, so yeah. they have got to play their own strength and, and then partner with other companies who can either come at the top or the bottom. So there's no big or small. I think the good part of this digital transformation is that everybody has almost equal play. It could be billion dollar company or could be startup as well. So yeah. uh, I mean, just to add, uh, we are actually managing the much bigger company than us in this case. We are a very small company, but what we are driving it is uh, there's like a multi-million dollar companies who are actually acting behind us. So I think mm -hmm. that's, that's what it uh, enabled the opportunities. So I was wondering if Alibaba Cloud was doing some blockchain and how did you see like the technology because it can be like complementary to, to cloud, but on some applications, maybe it's going to be a bit uh, competitive as a technology. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, how, how do you see it? Are you working in that space and, and yeah. So for today's session, right, actually Arno is the blockchain expert. <laughs> so we, I'm, I must confess that this, this space is the space that I have the least knowledge <laughs> in, <laughs> even though I, I know it's important, but I cannot understand. I cannot wrap my head around it. I think I leave it to the smarter folks to figure it out. So for, for myself, for what Alibaba does, I think we, we are quite, big on new technologies. Uh, but for us, when it comes to blockchain technology, uh, yeah. we are quite clear that we are not going to be in the uh, Bitcoin mining and all that stuff space. We are going to be in, in a separate space. And even within our ecosystem, we, we have quite a few products that are bundled around the blockchain. Uh, blockchain as a service basically is something that we have. Uh, it's just that I think depending on which stages, like, I mean, which types of companies, they may or may not uh, fit the, the entire uh, solution, the need. So, but Arno, definitely. Maybe, I know that you can always get in the office. Right so, let me make my, yeah. my uh, observation in blockchain. Um, I have an opportunity because of running this ecosystem, talking to many, many technology companies from different world. So, mm -hmm. blockchain, I personally have been observing that how do you apply in IoT per se. Uh, and a couple of the cases which has come to me for evaluation or even investment apparently, is uh, to address the interoperability kind of issues, right? Imagine in a factory, there are 
just for the discussion i'm taking a name like uh, there's a siemens plc there's a mitsubishi there's a uh, fuji so all of them how can they trust each other yet be able to integrate with each other so there are companies i know who have been working on creating a blockchain platform kind of trusted layer where multiple sources can get connected and the same time the application layer can kind of subscribe for those information and build application so i think blockchain yeah. like ano says is, is kind of not any more science fiction but at the same time it has gone way beyond just the bitcoin uh, which i never invested in apparently uh, so we will see more of use cases i guess blockchain and yeah. obviously we see with and if i may uh, add to you are totally right and uh, and maybe ora who is a certainly better expert than me and she can speak as well on uh, on some use cases but kyc uh, that she's on link right now Uh, I, I think the interoperability is something which is one of the biggest trend. You have hundreds of platforms for under enterprise blockchain. You have some big ones, uh, of course, Corda, Polygers, and uh, you name it, uh, Ethereum, and so on. Um, but there is still some um, today uh, some interoperability, but more at API level, not at block uh, interaction and hash level, but at API level. So when an event is done and processed, it can be still exported and recaptured. to another independent blockchain to still uh, you know handle the event flow and the uh, process orchestration so but api level and we we talk with people uh, some big consortium in maritime so i cannot name them uh, and we the, the way they build that and under their control it's really uh, today api uh, is really the way to go but the merge of blockchain the interoperability something even between enterprise and public is something which is in the air uh, maybe for the coming three years but i don't know how uh, might have better idea a lot of companies will have older technologies or old typical or traditional processors so yeah. for them to change to new new technology i think it i'm not sure how it will really take some time for them to understand and even try start changing it how can we progress this hello i think yeah so let let's hear you both i think both of you um, i'm sure have done projects in the legacy system if i can say and how did you deal with it uh, i'll have my own view but i'll leave it to you to share first yeah so can i start yeah, go ahead oh, sorry go ahead. yeah so hello well one things uh, we need to bear in mind at least based on our experience and i'm sure people have might have other experience uh, first blockchain will not save the world uh, there is plenty of situation when blockchain does not make sense zero sense uh, look only makes sense when you have you know a, a multiple ecosystem uh, of players we need to trust each other we need to share data or asset each other and where security is an important factors so so that for maybe central system can be perfect for 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 the use consider use case but should an a company want to move into blockchain it should not just to see that as an upgrade oh i will write off my previous system i build a new one now uh, we just feel that it's a kind of a layer uh, which very primarily is here to move from a peer to peer uh, communication to a collaborative uh, information and data sharing this kind of uh, little stuff on top people will always have their own uh, local database in cloud or on premise uh, uh, their oracle of the world but um, the thing is that this um, component would, would would be plugged onto uh, the existing infrastructure so unless you want to have a big gap but it should not be um, i would say a, a show stopper and um and uh, one of the things that well it's um uh, it has to be linked to a business case because uh, you, you you don't move into technology just uh, because oh uh, we need to be modern and all of this are really to make a short answer so normally it's not a big uh, show stopper we don't destroy everything and rebuild everything and whatever you do it has to be based on the situation the ecosystem you are living in and when it makes financially and economically sense to share those data receive some data in a collaborative way so, Yeah. So maybe the similarly, uh, Junwei, maybe what you could add, in not generally the blockchain, because I think this question mm. generally is applicable for all the industries. Yeah. That so about yeah. AI, IoT, their legacy system, their old processes. How do we kind of move them to the new technologies, uh, including blockchain? Right. Hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, for for Charan, uh, this uh, this is question can be for anything, man. So it's like there's yeah, always like right. all the digital tools. and uh and i guess for myself right i think the the more important thing to look at is you know how do uh, a couple of things uh how does the technology fit in the the rest of the company's businesses 
So in this case, uh, like Arno mentioned, if you're trying to force fit a blockchain solution into, into a problem that, that doesn't exist or is not uh, best solved by blockchain, then of course you're not going to get much uh, interest or uptake when it comes to that. And I think the second part to also think about is how do you start get started? Because if, if you think about it, if, if you pitch, even if the solution is amazing and perfect, and then you, know, you think that it's perfectly suited for this company, but you require them to put in heavy investments, hire a whole bunch of people in to, to get even get the first step, right? So chances are it's not going to be adopted. Right. So for myself, what I find those that work out are solutions that fit the problem and solutions that, that have a clear first step. Right. So you could get an easy first step to get on. Right. So that, that's basically my advice here. It really depends about how mature or open is your company to innovations. Uh, because it, it's true that uh, when you start something such as a an IoT project or blockchain project or AI project, you, you don't know what you will find at the end. So you need a certain uh, digital culture or innovation culture or mindset uh, from the decision makers to, to be able to take some risk. And sometimes money can be lost. Huh? That's uh, unfortunately yeah. the true reality. Uh, but, that, but as well, uh, I think the, 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 the right weapons. So our strategy, at least uh, at CETA, is really to leverage uh, the ecosystem of startup who are doing stuff faster than us, uh, very innovative, more aware on the market, agile, and uh, this combination between um, corporate and startup, we believe, is kind of a good way to go. 